The Nasty Sex Life of Celtic Tribes The ancient authors regularly described Celtic women as large, crafty, brave, and beautiful. Diodorus and Suetonius, in particular, described the sexual permissiveness of Celtic women. According to Suetonius, Caesar spent a lot of money on sexual experiences in Gaul. His legionnaires sang in the triumph that he had seduced a horde of Gallic women, calling him a bald whoremonger. Celtic women were described as fertile, prolific, and good breastfeeders. These are all clichés of the Greeks and Romans about barbarian peoples. Gerald of Wales describes how the Irish are the most jealous people in the world. While the Welsh lacked this jealousy and among them guest friendship prostitution was common. In the Irish saga of Conchobar Mac Nessa, the king is said to have the right to the first night with any marriageable woman and the right to sleep with the wife of anyone who hosted him. This is called the Gaius of the King. Whether this right actually existed and was exercised by the cults is not attested outside the sagas. In the saga The Sea Voyage of Male Duin, the conception of the main character occurs when a random traveler sleeps with a nun at a cloister. She says before this, our act is not beneficial if this is finally the time when I conceive. The suggestion that Irish women use this knowledge for birth control, sometimes drawn from this, is questionable. Large numbers of children are mentioned among the Celts by the ancient authors. The statement of Gerald of Wales that Inces had a pervasive presence in the British Isles is false according to modern scholars, since he complains only that a man can marry his cousins in the fifth, fourth, and third degrees. Incest played a key role in British Celtic myth, such as in the courting of Victin, as in other ancient cultures, like ancient Egypt or the pair of Zeus and Hera in classical Greece. In actual social life, however, a notable meaning cannot be found. In British Celtic law, women had in many respects, for instance marriage law, a better position than Greek and Roman women. According to Irish and Welsh law, attested from the early Middle Ages, a woman was always under the authority of a man, first her father, then her husband, and if she was widow of her son. She could not normally give away or pass on her property without their agreement. Her marriage was arranged by her male relatives, divorce and polygyny. The marriage of one man to several women were controlled by specific rules. Polyandry, the marriage of one woman to several men, was unusual, although some Celtologists conclude that it sometimes occurred from the Irish saga The Exile of the Sons of Vizlius. Kieser provides an example of the subordinate position of women. According to him, men had the power of life and death over their wives, as they did over their children, in a similar manner to the Roman pater familias. If the head of a high-ranking family died, his relatives would gather and interrogate the wives as well as the slaves, when the death seemed suspicious. Should they consider their suspicions to be correct, they would burn the wives after torturing them in every possible way. However, he also describes the financial role of the wives as remarkably self-sufficient. Caesar also says that among the Britons, up to a dozen men, father, sons, and brothers, could jointly possess their women. The resulting children would be assigned to whichever man was willing to marry the woman. Today, this is seen as a common cliché of ancient barbarian ethnography and political propaganda intended by Caesar to provide a moral justification for his campaigns. In general, monogamy was common, having several legal wives was limited to the higher social classes. Since marriage was seen as a normal agreement between two people, Cain Lanemna, agreement of two, it could be dissolved by both partners. A temporary marriage was also common. The position of the wife, Irish, Cat Munter, first of the household, or Prim Ben, chief woman, was determined by the size of the dairy she brought with her. There were three kinds of marriage, that in which the woman brought more than the man, that in which both brought about equal amounts, and finally that in which the woman brought less. If the husband wished to carry out a clearly unwise transaction, the wife possessed a sort of veto power. In a divorce, the wife usually had full control over her dowry. The concubine, Irish, at all trach, cf. Latin adultera, adultress, had much less power and was subordinate to the main wife. She had a legal duty to assist the first wife in case of illness and could be harassed and injured by her with impunity for the first three days after her marriage, with only very restricted rights of self-defense, pulling hair, scratching, and punching back. After these three days, the ordinary punishments would apply to both in the event of injury or murder. Adultery by the wife, unlike adultery by the husband, could not be atoned for with a fine. A divorce in the case of adultery could only occur with the agreement of both parties, and the wife was not permitted to seek one so long as her husband maintained intimate relations with her. If she was pregnant with her husband's child, she could not have intercourse with other men before the birth of the child, even if thrown out by him. 
These rules were binding for Celtic noblewomen, but they may have been less strictly binding on the lower classes. In Wales, the wife was allowed to leave her husband if he committed adultery three times, if he was impotent, and if he had bad halitosis taking with her the property which she had brought into the marriage or acquired during it. A sex exploitation had to be atoned for by the culprit by handing over the sort of gifts customarily given at a wedding and paying a fine since it was considered a form of temporary marital tie. So what did they actually say? According to Cassius Dio, who was writing a long time after the fact, so presumably got his information from more contemporaneous sources, Julia Augusta, wife of the Emperor Augustus, was shocked by the loose morals of Celtic women. On complaining to one such the consort of a Gaulish king, the woman is said to have replied, we Celtic women obey the demands of nature in a more moral way than do the women of Rome. We consort openly with the best of men. You allow yourselves to be debauched in secret by the vilest. Heiser tells us that women are shared between groups of up to a dozen men, particularly between brothers or between fathers and sons. But Kieser is a bisexual Roman aristocrat and may be functionally unable to distinguish between women being shared and women choosing lovers. Certainly other sources suggest that women have leading roles in battle, while Poseidonius relates the extreme ferocity of the women in battle. All of which tells us the Romans were probably afraid of women who didn't conform to the Roman ideal a well-behaved, submissive girl who grows up with the sole interest in rearing children, doing needlework and cooking. Docile women are safe women. Women who choose to take up arms in battle probably aren't. So let's look at how life was lived, the Britons of the late pre-Roman Iron Age, and yes, I think that title is both racist and stupid. But it's the one the archaeologists use, lived in round houses. Jez Butterworth's Citadel is a fiction. I've slept in a roundhouse. It's an amazing and magical experience. But it's not conducive to mongogamy. When 30 or 40 people are sleeping in the same space, it's unlikely, not to say highly improbable, that they'll all choose the same pairings night after night. Why would they, ancient Greek writers, grew up to tell us how much the young men of the salts prefer each other to their women? Aristotle says that the belligerent nations were much influenced in warfare by their women, but unusual because the men openly preferred each other to their womenfolk. Not at all like the Greeks then, much. On the women's side, the entire basis for the word lesbian comes from one of the greatest of the Greek woman poets who wrote verse to her female lovers, and you can tell a lot about a culture from its laws even in ancient Ireland, the last surviving Celtic nation. Women were allowed to divorce their husbands if they were disinclined to sleep with them through age, infirmity, or homophile inclinations. Somewhat contradictorily, many classical writers noted that Celtic men preferred to have sex with each other. Diodorus Siculus stated that, although Celtic women were beautiful, their men preferred to sleep with each other. Siculus also noted that it was an insult if a guest refused an offer of sex from a Celtic man. The Greek philosopher Posidonius also stated that in Gaul, men prefer to have sex with each other. These sweeping statements may be a misinterpretation of Celtic male bonding rituals and certainly don't suggest that Celtic men only slept with women under sufferance. However, what they do show is that homophile relationships were not prohibited or taboo amongst the cults and that they had a flexible approach to sexuality.